Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. We're finding ourselves in September now, with, uh, getting a bit of a break of our heat here in Texas, which I'm thankful for. We've got some good stuff to cover this week with Alan Foster from our Scoundrels team taking us through the framework bits. I appreciate that. Let's hop on in. I'll hand the mic over to Alan Foster here. Alan? Hey, thanks, Chris. Cool. Uh, so jumping straight into new modules, uh, community member Cody Martin has contributed three new modules for the Cisco Unified IP 7937G workstation. Uh, the first module provides SSH privilege escalation by resetting the SSH administrative credentials on the target via an HTTP request to local menu CGI. The second module adds denial of service by connecting to the target's SSH service with an incompatible key exchange, causing vulnerable targets to become unresponsive until power cycled. And lastly, a additional denial of service module that forces the target to reboot via specially crafted packets. Community member Heinick Petrak added a auxiliary LDAP hash dump module for dumping passwords and hashes from LDAP servers. And finally, community member Red0XFF has contributed a SQL injection module for PEP link devices with firmware versions less than 7.0.1. And this module builds upon the work that um, he contributed as part of his Google Summer of Code, which is pretty awesome. Super cool. Uh, carrying on with enhancements and features, uh, community member B. Coles has improved the free BSD RTLD exact privilege escalation module by using the auto check mixin and preferring to CC over GCC. Um, there has been improvements to the search functionality of Metasploit, which has been improved by myself, Alan Foster, and we will see a quick demo of this later. And our very own Chris Granlis has added support for supplying a search index to the info command to view modules details. And carrying on, um, the Windows Enum Patches module has been improved by community member 47 Arjun um, to now display the applied patch date. Uh, so, a small tweak there. And community member GG Kitsas has added support for generating zip files for a zip slip exploit. And finally, our very own Dean Welch has improved the MSF Venom boot up time by lazily loading the Faker gem as well as fixing and finding a performance regression that was um, loading unrelated module sets. And for enhancements and features, uh, our very own Todd Beardsley has added a new security markdown file to the Metasploit framework repository so that users uh, that have found security issues know how they can be reported to the project maintainers. Our very own Will Vu has updated the Java RMI server module to provide a check command. And the check command is powered by the auxiliary scanner MISC Java RMI server. Um, and finally, uh, community member Edge Balsi, hopefully that's correct, has added a new reflective P file loader as a payload stage. And we will see a recorded demo of this later by Spencer McIntyre that security.md file that Todd Beardsley added is probably worth calling out a little bit further. Um, folks tend to report security issues in Metasploit itself, uh, usually framework through a whole bunch of different mechanisms, you know, on Slack and, and GitHub issues. Uh, sometimes they'll email one of the developer email lists. Um, and, you know, we, we want you all to, to be able to engage with us and with Rapid7 security team um, as quickly as possible when there is a security issue, because of course we always want to address those in a timely manner. Uh, so take a look at that and it, it provides a whole bunch of ways to get in touch with us easily and, and through the right channels. Yeah, well said, Caitlin. And for bug fixes, uh, our very own Spencer McIntyre has fixed um, slash improved the error handling for auxiliary scanners by allowing modules to skip hosts and continue when a fail with exception has been raised. Uh, community member B. Coles has contributed a fix for a path traversal vulnerability within Metasploit itself. 
The squid pivot scanning module has also been updated to have improved status code handling as well as module logging. Uh, and that's been contributed by community member CRX 4443 um, And I believe that's been used in Hack the Box, which is why that has been fixed, which is pretty awesome. Um, and finally, Maria Belen TC has added support for auxiliary actions to now be used as commands. And we will see a recorded demo of this later as well. Uh, awesome. So as always, uh, for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog posts on blog.rabbit7.com. And finally, we really appreciate everyone who makes Metasploit better through contributions to the project. So a big thank you to you. And jumping on to demos, uh, Spencer McIntyre has provided a recorded demo of the PE inject module. Hello everyone, I am going to be demonstrating the brand new payload stage that was contributed to Metasploit. Uh, so this payload stage is the PE injector. So what I want to first show is that we are going to get a meterpreter session over a standard reverse TCP stager. This is basically to show there's there's nothing up my sleeve. So we have a reverse TCP stager that we're, we're gonna use over here and we already have our uh, listener that's configured over here. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna, we're gonna run this binary. We're gonna set up our session. And so we see that we have our session established. <clears throat> if I can type here, we'll see that it's all working. So everything everything's good the way that uh that we would expect it to that's because we generated a reverse tcp stager portable executable and we transferred it over to this windows system uh that we're demonstrating over here uh but now what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate the brand new payload stage so instead of sending meterpreter up to this system we're going to send a custom pe file that is going to be mapped using this brand new stage so we're going to use the new PE inject stage, that's Windows PE inject right here. Um, we're still gonna use the reverse TCP stager. I'm gonna show our options. We're gonna set our L host to uh, the same host. This is the one that I'm running my virtual machine on with the same port that we were just using previously for our uh, meterpreter stage. Uh, but this time we're going to, instead of sending up meterpreter again, we're gonna send up a custom PE file that I'm gonna specify. And so that's what we have right here. We're going to have it go ahead and we're gonna have it run the 32-bit version of PuTTY. That's because I'm using the 32-bit version of the stage. Uh, we also have Uh, the 64-bit under the x64 uh, directory, so you can get that as well. So if you wanted to run a 64-bit version of uh, PuTTY or of any PE file that you'd want to use, we've tested this out with uh, executables as well as DLLs. Um, you would just use the, the corresponding version to that one. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to run the 32-bit version. And so here we go. We have all of our settings run up here again. So we're going to run two handlers. So, whoops, have to... Stop our job here first. Now we're gonna run our handler here and we're gonna run the exact same executable over here. But this time when we run it, it is going to start up putty. And so what this showed is that uh, the new stage went ahead and it loaded the PE file into our memory and it pre-mapped it before uploading it to the memory of the target system. And then it called the executable's entry point, allowing it to be run. So here we have a functioning PuTTY installation that's running in memory that was mapped from uh, the brand new payload stage. And uh, we can go ahead and interact with it and showing that it's all working. Um, so this was an executable that pops up a window um, as we can see here, but if you are like a pen tester or a red teamer, you can use this to package up a DLL file that you might wanna have run and it'll call DLL main just as you would expect. And so you can have it running your, your custom payload from within there. So it's pretty cool stuff. Thank you. Great. And we have a another demo from Spencer McIntyre showing the Google Summer of Code changes. Hey, I'm going to demonstrate some features that came from this year's Google Summer of Code contributions. 
Uh, one of the first ones is the ability for module authors to be able to optionally display uh, module options. And this would be the data store options you would get when you do show options. Uh, so to demonstrate this, I'm going to use a vulnerability from a little bit earlier this year, the Exchange ECP view state, and that's because this is one of many modules that leverages the com uh, command stager on the back end. So now if you're a Metasploit user, you're probably hopefully familiar with this, that when you run an exploit module, it's going to show that it's running a command, it's going to give you like a little progress bar. Uh, but what some users may not know is that you actually have the ability to set the command stager flavor. There's quite a few different options here. Now, some of these options such as curl, PSH, invoke web request, stage from a HTTP server. Other options like VBS and born do not. So when you set the command stager flavor to one that does stage from an HTTP server, when we do show options, we get the ability to set our server host and our server port. That would be the IP address information of where Metasploit should start the server to listen for the incoming connection. Now that makes sense to display to the module user because we're using a command stager that actually uses that option. What we can now avoid though, is when say the default of the VBS is used and we show our options, uh, we no longer show the server host and the server port in the module's data store options. That's because when the command stager is set to uh, the VBS flavor, there there is no server that started up. So we're not going to be prompting the user for an option that they're not going to be able to actually leverage. If they set the server host uh, in this configuration, that option is not going to be used. So it might cause some users to be confused as to why we're requesting server host information. So this is only used in a couple of uh, modules so far. The command stager is, is definitely one of them. We hope to expand this use in the future so that way we're not necessarily confusing the users and prompting them to set options that aren't going to be used based on the current configuration. That was one change. The other is the ability to run actions as commands. So I'm going to switch over here to another uh, recent module and that was for CVE 2020-6287. Uh, this was a popular SAP vulnerability that came out a couple months ago as well. And so when we show these options here, this particular vulnerability allows Metasploit to create an administrative user on vulnerable instances of an SAP server. So down here, uh, the default auxiliary action is to go ahead and add the specified user. So you would set your R host, uh, the username and a password. And when you run this module, uh, if the server is vulnerable and everything works out correctly, you should have a brand new account based on the information that you had set. Now this module also uh, allows the account to be removed and that's exposed via the auxiliary action. So you can add or you can remove uh, the specified user. Now, to make this a little bit easier, we can also use the add command and the remove command. Now, what you might not see is that I'm actually also able to tab complete it uh, from the module. So since I have used this module and I'm in the context here, I have the ability to tab complete those two actions as commands that are available to me within the context of this module. Finally, if we want to go ahead and we want to print out the help output uh, down here in the auxiliary command section, we do have the two actions to add and remove the user are exposed as the options down here. So hopefully that should make it a little bit easier that if the user is going to go ahead and leverage this functionality, they can set the data store options as appropriate and they can toggle between the different actions such as add and remove by simply running the add and remove command. Um, this would also be very helpful in context of modules that might be like uploading and downloading or deleting files or something along those lines or any kind of auxiliary 
module that takes a few data store options and then has different actions associated with them. So this should help to kind of streamline that process and that user experience just a little bit. And again, this was a contribution from one of the two uh, Google Summer of Code students this year. Thank you very much. Awesome, that was great. Thank you, Pass Spencer. Uh, awesome, so jumping into final demo, uh, which is changes to the search functionality. Um, so prior to this release, when searching for uh, the keywords Postgres based login, the search command would return all modules that matched either Postgres or login. Uh, this would often result in a large amount of search results being returned, often unrelated. Um, so in the above scenario, 253 results have been returned for search Postgres login. And with the latest version of Metasploit, uh, the search functionality has been updated to require for all words to be matched. So in this scenario, only one valid result is returned. Um, so hopefully now it's a lot easier to search for the modules you actually want to search for. Um, other scenarios I've seen this be useful for is like SMB enumeration. You can do SMB space enum, and it'll only give you SMB modules related to enumeration rather than a whole bunch of unrelated um, enum modules. So just a quick demo there. And any questions on that? That's really cool. Yeah, nice. And that's everything for the Metasploit framework side of things. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. And thanks, everybody, uh, Virtual Spencer and Alan for the demos. <laughs> uh, we'll roll into an update on Attacker KB, the attacker knowledge base, where you can learn about and discuss which ones matter and why. Just visit attackerkb.com. Um, we do have a demo today from Aaron on exploited in the wild reporting. This is an update on a little bit of a change that we are making to the uh, exploited in the wild. Uh, it was previously a tag um, down here on the assessment. Uh, by the way, this is a, a combination effort by myself and our new team member, Jorge Huerta. So thanks, Jorge, for the help on this one. So uh, before, by the way, this is not yet deployed. We're, I just didn't want to deploy on a Friday, so coming soon. Uh, before you might remember that we had a tag down here in the assessment called exploited in the wild uh, that you could select to indicate vulnerabilities that are um, actively exploited. Um, instead, we have moved that feature up to the top of the page. There's now a button here that says report as exploited in the wild. When you click on it, you'll get a little modal telling you what exploited in the wild means. And if you want to report it, you can go ahead and click on the report as exploited button. Uh, the page will refresh and you'll get a nice little badge over here indicating that it was already, uh, that it was marked as exploited in the wild. It tells you who reported it. You can uh, click on this link to go to a user profile. Uh, and when it's reported, it's done. We uh, don't intend for multiple reports to be up here, just kind of one and done. Um, similarly, I'm going to go to a new page. If you wanted to report, but also add more details, uh, if you click this button, uh, reports as normal, uh, scrolls you down the page and lets you add an assessment. I already had an assessment here, so drop me into the edit form. So you can go say, uh, you know, I saw this. It's real, probably something more than that, and submit your assessment like normal. There it is. So small little change. Um, in the future, future improvement, we're going to be working on adding an extra control for this um, in the assessment here as well. So a little checkbox basically does the same thing. But the goal of this was basically to just make it really easy for somebody to go in and indicate this was exploded in the wild without having to write up <clears throat> a full assessment if they didn't want to. So uh, kind of a new look for an old feature and uh, some more work on this will be coming soon as well. Uh, any questions I can answer? Just to be clear, Aaron, you still do need to be um, logged in with GitHub to, to use yes, that? Correct. Cool. Um, I believe I can maybe demonstrate this if I go into, does this exist? Yes, no, it doesn't. 
oh, uh, I was going to try to go to a new CVE, but I um, inadvertently, okay, there we go. Yeah, so if I try to report this and I'm not logged in, I get a little error message that just says log in. Uh, and if you have a session stored, it will log in for you. Uh, and you can't take it back, right? Once you, once uh, you. In my branch, no, but in work that's coming soon, you can undo it by, uh, if you have an assessment, you can undo it by going into an assessment and unchecking your box. Uh, currently, there's no way to undo it just from this level, but that might be something that we change in the future. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, you know who's going to use this feature a bunch this week? That's it's awesome. It's me. So get as soon as we can. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Excellent.